made in the image of God. I'm going to read it for you again. Genesis 1, 26. Then God said, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. They will reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, the livestock, all the wild animals on the earth. And the small animals that scurry along the ground. So God created human beings in His own image. There's the phrase again. In the image of God who created them. Male and female He created them. Then God blessed them and said, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and govern it. Reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, and all the animals that scurry along the ground. Um, this is a, an amazing text. Um, it tells us we're made in, in the image of God. Now, uh, what we did last week, by the way, this is all my scribbling, and, and I just left it there. I figured I've got some other scribbling to do here in a minute, but maybe it'll jog some memories for you. But last week, a lot of the discussion centered around um, statements that I made. Um, assertion number one, if we are like God, that means... By definition, we are only like Him. Therefore, we are not Him. Why would you even have to say that? Well, some people need to know that we're not God. Amen. I don't know why that is. I, I have no trouble believing that I'm not God. How about you? Um, assertion 2 is very similar. If we are like God, that means that by definition, we're only like Him. Therefore, there is also part of us that is not like Him. So, um, this whole idea of where is the... The line, God, man, uh, it's, it's a pretty remarkable study. Only, only Jesus Christ, think of this, this is unique, and even among the members of the Trinity, only Jesus is the beautiful God-man. There is no other in, in entity. I mean, just that He alone. 100% God, 100% man. Uh, the first several hundred years of the history of the church, there's a lot of important discussions about that. Well, how will we define him? How do you, how do you say that he's 100% God? He's 100% man. How can he be both? But that is exactly who and what he is and, and is eternally. And uh, so we, we talked about some of this idea of how we are pretty uncomfortable um, talking about this uh, this idea of us being in the image of God. Here, well, let me say this way. We're comfortable to say we are made in the image of God. Most Christians, we're very at ease with that. And we're comfortable saying we are made in His likeness. And just show of hands, how many of you, yeah, I'm okay with it. We're made in the likeness of God. Okay, here's where we start to get a little uncomfortable. So we are like God. Well, we are like God, but we when we say that, we don't we? We want to give a little definition. Okay, here's what I mean when I say that. Yeah. We're nothing like Him. It's just that we're like Him. You know? And so that whole area, and uh, that sort of led to, uh, to this uh, talk about theosis, um, that you go back and, and uh, watch the video if you'd like, theosis. There's something about the human being that is God's crowning achievement in the realm of creation. Let me just wrap up last week's discussion by simply saying that God made humans very special. They're very special to Him. Um, and that does not mean that man ever crosses that line, but actually what it means is that God crossed this line, God became man, and in doing so, God, Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ, through offering His very own lifeblood as a sacrifice for our sins, welcomed us in. And says, I, I want you to be part of the family of God. So we're going to move forward tonight uh, with assertion number four. The Imago Dei, the image of God, is modeled from the beginning by the father-son relationship. This is an interesting idea. In fact, several well-known Bible teachers through the centuries have landed at this. In fact, <clears throat> in fact, John Calvin um, believed that this is entirely what's meant by the fact that we're made in the image of God. I, I wouldn't say that, but I would say it's important. But for him, it was so important that we understand the image of God is the father-son relationship. And if I could, 
see, do I got any ink here? So to me, the father-son relationship um, is about this. The up and down vertical relationship. And what I mean by that, um, it's not brother to brother. It's not sister to sister. Um, it, but father to son, this speaks of generations. And um, before, before any of you start tracking down a road and chasing rabbit trails and saying, okay, where are we headed with this? Um, you know, some of you might say, well, I'm a lady. Am I left out? Is it only father-son? No. Um, but some of you might say, oh, now, now that you said that, Pastor Keith, well, what are you implying? I hear some of these weirdos out there talking about Mother Earth and the feminine side of God. Do you believe that, Pastor Keith? No. <laughs> um, but I, I think we'll... we'll cover some of these things as we move on, but I want to read a scripture that um, is a pretty important text that gives an idea of the father-son relationship. Um, Genesis 22, we're not going to read the whole chapter, we could read the chapter, this is just a refresher, but just remember some of the amazing things that happen in Genesis 22. If you do not know the story, uh, just a very quick thumbnail sketch. Um, Abraham was told, your name is no longer Abram, but is Abraham. That means you're going to be father of nations. He was told this when he didn't have any kids. Sometimes we just forget. So... He has no kids, and he's told, look up at the sky. See all those stars? That's how many descendants you're going to have. Okay, God. <laughs> Another time he's told, look at the sand of the seashore. That's how many kids are going to be your offspring. And at one point, Abraham said, that's great, God, but I don't have any kids. I don't have any. Should I go and marry my maidservants, uh, my maidservant, and have children with her, and... and and of course he did. And anytime us humans get our fingers on God's idea, we, we, it doesn't go well, does it? When we try to force God's hand, it, I don't know, no, no. there's just a, there's a timing thing, there's a, a faith thing, there's this idea of just wait, just wait, just wait. You ever been there? Just wait. And then all of a sudden, whoosh, the light turns green. Uh, God's timing is amazing. So, um, so finally, this guy Abraham does have a, a child. His name is Yitzchak. You should say that. It's fun. Yitzchak. You feel German when you... I'm very guttural. Isaac. It means laughter. It means he laughs. God does this amazing thing, and, and um, an angel is sent to Sarah, and... She's told that she's going to have a baby. She just laughs her head off. God says, why is Sarah laughing? Sarah says, I didn't laugh. God says, yeah, you did. You can't hide that from me. Um, Abraham laughs his head off too. He doesn't get in trouble though. God says, why are you laughing? He says, I'm 99. She's 90. Wouldn't you laugh? I mean, I would be laughing. I would die. No. <laughs> but suddenly, finally, after all the years, and I, if I remember correct, I think um, 15 years, so I need somebody else to help me. I think around age 86, somewhere around there, Abraham receives the promise. All those years pass. Finally, he is holding the child of promise. And he names him Yitzhak. He laughs. We laugh. Everybody's laughing. Who could believe this? And really the name implies God gets the last laugh. That's really what it's all about. And uh, it's an amazing story. So, But here in Genesis 22, God does something that seems so absurd. 
I, um, Abraham, I want you to take, let's just read it. Sometime later, God tested Abraham's faith. Abraham, God called. Yes, he replied, here I am. Take your son, your only son, yes, Yitzhak, whom you love so much, and go to the land of Moriah. Go and sacrifice him as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I will show you. And the next morning, Abraham got up early. He saddled his donkey and took two of his servants with him, along with his son Isaac. And then he chopped wood for a fire for a burnt offering and set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day of their journey, Abraham, told this, uh, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. Stay here with the donkey, Abraham told the servants. The boy and I will travel a little farther. We will worship there and hear this great statement of faith. And then we will come right back. I don't know what God's up to. I know what He's asking me to do. But I trust Him. Amen. And uh, so it's, it's a really unbelievable test. I don't, quite honestly, I don't know. Um, I don't know if I could handle this test. I, I would hope I could. I don't know if I could. I, um, after, after our son was arrested, um, we were given a book, actually my mother-in-law gave me a book titled Laying Your Isaac on the Altar. Life-changing book. But the, each of us, in some way, somehow, we have to lay Isaac on the altar. And it is, it is something so painful, it's something so hard. But all of this is for God's glory. Now, okay, so I want you to just help me look at these scripture, these words, this verse up here, these verses, are there any things about it that stand out to you that are similar to the story of God sending His Son Jesus for our sins? Can you just name some things? What stands out to you? Anything at all? Sacrifice. sacrifice. Okay, sacrifice. Faith in God. What is it? Faith in God, okay. We're just going to... Yeah, trust in God. Okay, trust in God, faith, faith. trust. What What else? Obedience. Obedience. Get, get more... Um, you Go guys are, are being too heady. I want you to see some <laughs> obvious stuff. Like, are there any similarities? Your only son. Your own, oh, there, your only son. Leave it to John. John. Your only son. Um, any other stuff like that? Any other things? I guess you could say, for instance, I mean, we just covered it, but that father-son, this thing here, is very loud and clear. It's a son that he loved. Um, does anything notice? Anything stand out to you about verse number four? How about the donkey? Verse number four. Third day. I thought third day. I, just, I don't know if there's any meaning to it, but it just struck me. Isn't that interesting? The third day, and of course Jesus rose on the third day. Darren, did you have another one? What was it? What about the donkey? Oh, the donkey. Jesus yeah. rode. I hadn't yeah. thought of that. Rode into town on a, a donkey. Um, <laughs> He said he, yeah. was, he said he was coming right back or he would be back. Or he would yeah. be back. Jesus re said he would return yeah. and um, Abraham said right back. So, I mean, these, these are amazing things. Maybe there are there a couple of others. I Abraham mean, told his servants, Jesus told his disciples. Okay, so Abraham told his servants just the same way Jesus told the disciples. There's a lot of interesting correlations between this story and the story of Jesus being offered as a sacrifice. Um, I guess now, can you look at this, can you think of any differences? Like do any, what's different about this story from the story of Jesus? A test of faith. Yeah. Okay, a, a test of faith, okay. That's, that's different because Christ had it all, all down, was ready to go. Yes, okay, G yeah, Jesus did not it experience it that way. And, I mean, to carry that thought, a little further, um, with Jesus, this wasn't a test. It was the real deal. It right. was right. 
because he Excellent. What else? Any other things? Uh, I, I, Isaac came, went home with him. Jesus went to heaven to his father. Oh, wow. That's that's beautiful. You guys have a, I love the way your brains work. <laughs> you all have beautiful brains. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and okay. You know, Isaac uh, was old enough to smack his dad in the nose. <laughs> okay, true, true. We picture Isaac as this Not little helpless little boy. boy. Probably, you, Joanne, you might have to help me, but I, I think I remember reading that he would have probably been around 12, maybe even 14. 18, somewhere, yep, up the, somewhere in there. 14. In that age. And this is a big kid. I mean, he's he's saying, hey, Dad, I see the wood and yes. I see the stuff to make but the fire. The sacrifice? But where's the sacrifice? So there was some willingness on his part, too. Yes. Well, if he was maybe 18, that would make his dad, what, about 120? Wow, I mean, yeah, yeah, so, I mean... He could probably handle the old guy. He probably could, probably could, so... Okay, so let's, um, let's, let's learn a big old nine dollar word. Um, I need some space. There's a Greek word. Anthropos. You probably have heard that word and you just don't know it. Um, it means man. So, um, a lot of studies in colleges and in universities come from this phrase right here, anthropos. Anthropology, mm -hmm. uh, the study of the sciences, the, the study of the science of humanities. A lot of um, different liberal arts colleges have classes that come back to, to this word, anthropos. Then there's this other word maybe you, you've heard before. Theos. Um, so that is the word for God, not the, the name God, but the word that means is translated God. So from these two words you get, you get um, like I said, anthropology. Uh, that's, that's a discipline of studies in the, in the universities. Theology, theos, is the study of God. I'm a purist. I, I believe that theology should be study of who God is, what He's like, how He interacts with His people. Theology has gone through a rough time through the centuries. In fact, in the 1800s, um, there, there was a stretch, maybe even a little sooner than that, about 150 years, where scientists over in Germany were discovering things. And they were proving things. And theologians got pretty nervous because scientists were challenging the validity of the Bible as the Word of God. And instead of what they should have done, they should have said, baloney, the Bible doesn't need to defend itself. It will stand the test of time. Amen. You don't have to worry about God. He's plenty capable of defending his own, his, himself. Instead of that, some who were more liberal minds, who, who um, I don't want to call their faith into question, but I seriously wonder if they had relationship with Jesus Christ. They felt threatened. They felt their positions were being threatened. And so they started explaining the Bible according to science. It's, it's an age called the Enlightenment. You can read about the Enlightenment. 150 years in which some of the um, most bizarre things happened over in Germany at a little town called Tübingen and the university there, they, um, they started explaining how miracles in the Bible didn't really happen. Um, that, don't you understand that was just a literary device? 
And um, they started saying things like, the writers of the Bible were not really truly recording historical accounts. They were doing things like redacting existing uh, uh, writing, and they were editors, and, and they were copyists. And so really, the Bible that we have in our hand, we can't trust that it was in, even intended to be pieced together the way it is now. It was just, it was just you know, that men got a hold of it, and they changed things. And all of this was to try to make sure that we didn't offend any scientists who were now saying, wait a minute, the earth's not flat. Earth is round. Wait a minute, the earth is not the center of, the, of our galaxy. The, the sun is. And, and people who should have just said, don't worry, the Bible will defend itself, started going, whoa, whoa, whoa wait, wait, wait a minute, we got to make this. So they started, but for all practical purposes, tearing pages out of the Bible and just... I mean, that's not true. We can do away with that. Oh, that's not how that book ended. And sure, this actually wasn't written by one person. It was three different people over many years. That's, that explains that. And a lot of nonsense. But I, I'm one, I'm a purist. I believe theology should study God, who He is, what He's like, and bring that into the hands of people in the most simple terms, um, we don't need to change anything about the Bible. The Bible is the way that God has chosen to reveal His interaction with humanity through the ages, and He's recorded it for us in His book, the Holy Bible. And so, if we, if we honor that, then we don't get into trouble. So, why would we bring all that up? It has to do with the study of the image of God. The Imago Dei, in John chapter 3, uh, for this is how God loved the world. You're going to see some of these things that we pointed out, and this is just three verses. This is how God loved the world. He gave His, here's that phrase, one and only Son. He gave His one and only Son. He didn't just test Jesus, and, and the Father didn't just say, I want to see if you would be willing to go through this, but he, in, in His perfect plan, He actually gave His Son. Jesus, in His perfection, actually laid down His life as a sacrifice, so that everyone who believes in Him will not perish, but have eternal life. God sent His Son into the world, not to judge the world, but to save the world through Him. <laughs> There is no judgment against anyone who believes in Him, but anyone who does not believe in Him has already been judged for not believing in God's one and only Son. I really believe there's something powerful about the image of God, the Imago Dei, in this idea of the Father-Son relationship. And um, so from... <laughs> From these, these Greek words, there's this other Greek word, and, and it's, if these are $9 words, I don't know what you would call this one. It's a doozy. Anthropomorphism means, all right, you're, let's do it again, anthropomorphism. That's, wow, that's a big word. It means, that God communicates Himself to man in a way that man can understand and relate to God. So, we have things like this in Scripture. God's arm is not short that He cannot extend it to reach. You... The psalm says, you are the apple of his eye. There is a scripture that speaks of the finger of God. Often we read of the, the hand of God. Um, without being too graphic, if, if we were Hebrew like over in Israel, it wouldn't bother us. But as Americans, we're not comfortable with this. But his bowels 
are moved with compassion for us. So all of these are descriptors that, that image God for us with a, a body. And so, but the point is, how are we to take that? Does, do I mean, does that mean to say that God literally has an arm, that God literally has an eye? Well, I can't answer the question for you. I can only tell you this, that God created a way to interface with humanity. And, and at some point, there must have been a discussion among the Godhead. How, will, how do we model it? How do we image it to them? Well, I think if we make them like us, let's just make them like us. What will that be like? It has to be Father, Son. But Father, you know that if we call it Father, Son, then you know how humans are. They're going to start saying, well, wait, if he's Father, then he has to be male. And, and he has to, I mean, you don't have a son without a mommy. And the human mind tries to figure these things out. But God says it's worth the risk. Because there is no better way to speak their language than the oneness, the connectedness that we have as Father, Son. And I understood it. I can't find words for it. But I understood it the moment I held my son. The moment he was born. Held him in my arms. Oh, I mean, it's glorious. Both of them, Zach and Dick. I remember in the hospital room saying, I'm going to be at every Little League baseball game. I'm going to every parent-teacher conference. Finally, when Zach got to seventh grade, he's like, Dad, could we cut that out? Could you just maybe let Mom come? Or could I do it on my own? I'm kind of, you know. Um, I wanted to be there for my kids. I, I love them. There's nothing I wouldn't do for them. But I don't think that it's accurate then to say, okay, and some people have done this. Well, then that means that God has a human body. Some people have even described it for us. He's six foot nine, and the distance of his hand is approximately 18 inches from the bottom of the palm to the tip of the... I don't know where that comes from. <laughs> and so here's, here's what we must keep in mind. I do think, uh, even though this is such a huge word that we never use, anthropomorphism, there is a sense in which that is true. God must communicate to us, but there's things that these little peanut brains cannot figure out. There's no way. And yet he's willing to take the risk. He says, you're made in my image, and the same way that I as Father God love my own son, and I'm willing to give him for your sacrifice. You understand what that father-son relationship is like. Now, having told you that I, I don't believe, um, well, let me just say it this way. We, father-son, we understand. Mother-daughter, we understand. Mother-son, we understand. Father-daughter, we understand. Those are powerful connectors. And, and if you're talking in terms of just an imagery, something to help you understand what that relationship is like, there is a powerful thing that goes on from generation to generation. Amen. I, I don't know how to explain it. I know that many people believe in what's called generational curses. I don't definitionally believe in that. I, because the scripture is very clear. Who sinned, this man or his parents? Neither. It was for the glory of God. There was a, a place where um, the prophet said, you will quote this proverb, uh, the, the kids eat sour grapes and their, their, children, their children's teeth are set on edge. The parents eat sour grapes, their children's teeth are set on edge. And it's used as a way of saying, no, that's not how it, it works. I, I believe that every individual stands on their own merit before the Lord. I don't believe that you are cursed because your parents were cursed, because their parents were cursed. But here's something that I do have to say. There's something so powerful about generations. So powerful. <coughs> and, and the enemy of our souls would be a dummy. If he didn't try the same stuff Amen. that worked on mom and dad, yeah. 
I mean, if, if it worked on mom and dad, it'll probably work on this one too. Let's just keep trying it. And that type of curse that needs to be broken off of family lines, although I wouldn't say uh, hard and fast that I call it a generational curse. But um, this, this is a powerful, powerful thing. Now, just to follow up on the discussion about God. So does God have a body? Well, God is spirit. Amen. And we worship Him in spirit and in truth. The things of God are only discerned spiritually. Does God have a body? Well, the Bible says that God is omnipresent. What does that mean? That means He's all places at all times. He cannot be contained by anything, anywhere in the universe. It's all His. He is all places at all times. Go to the highest heavens, He's there. Go to the depths of the earth, He's there. Go to the lowest hell, you will find He is there. Scripture says in the Psalms. So He's omnipresent. He's also omniscient. Omniscient. He knows everything. He is everywhere. He knows all things. And He is omnipotent. Omnipotent. Yes. He is all powerful. Yes. Those are the ways that we describe God. So, does God have a body? No, God does not. He is not contained by a body. But yet, Jacob wakes up in the morning after using a rock for a pillow. And what does he say? Surely, well, first he says, Al. He's, he wakes up and he says, Surely, the presence of the Lord was in this place. And I was not aware of it. I did not know it. So now think about that. So He is God who is all places at all times. There's nothing beyond the scope of who He is. And yet, He can concentrate His presence so powerfully in a place. And aren't you glad? How many of you have experienced the touch of God? When, when, I mean, the way that we use our language, we say, Lord, we invite you to this place. Please come here to meet with us today. Well, we know that He's already here. We know there's nothing that's closed off from Him. And yet, miracle of miracles, many times He manifests His presence in a place. So I, I will leave you with, with this thought. Um, Jesus had a body. Jesus, his body was raised from the dead. His physical body was raised from the dead. Right. And by implication, by all of his teaching, and by the way, before we leave that thought, Paul went to great lengths in 1 Thessalonians 15, uh, I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians 15, to talk about the resurrection from the dead and what that means. It's a physical body. John the Apostle went to great lengths to say, I held him, I touched him, we beheld him. And he was talking to people that were saying, no, the Christ is just an idea, it's just sort of a mind thought. No, no, no. He physically rose from the dead. Amen. So he... His body was resurrected from the dead. The 100% God-man. And yet His body wasn't like you and me, was it? The disciples are all in the upper room. And they're just hanging out. They're fearful and worried. And all of a sudden, Jesus is just there. He's standing right in the middle of them. And apparently, He just, I don't know, came through the wall. What do you think about that? I don't know. He's just there. What's up, guys? Yeah, hey guys, it's me. And, and they say, you know, is this a ghost? He says, well, you know, do ghosts have, you know, can you reach out and touch a ghost? Here, feel the scars in my hands. Hey, do you got any food? Let me have a little fish. <laughs> and then just as quick as he came, just look at his split. Where did he go? Where did Jesus go? He's gone. So... So there is the sense that he gives us the idea that our resurrected bodies are going to be amazing. I don't know how it's going to work. It's going to be amazing. 
I'm pretty uncomfortable with saying God the Father has a body, but I'm comfortable with saying some way, somehow, we're made like Him. And I don't know what that means. I can only say that when I look at ants and um, little, you know, crawly bugs, I say, ooh, man, I'm, I'm way more sophisticated than that. And I can look at termites, you know, Darren, he wipes out termites. He's a termite executor, you know. <laughs> We're way more intelligent than termites. Sometimes. And I... Well, sometimes we're not. Yeah, so, well, as humans. And then sometimes, look, if you, if you were to take a microscope and look at bacteria and see it crawling around, and you, you would think, well, there's some kind of life form there. But we're way more sophisticated than that. Now move on up the line. I look at a horse or I look at a dog and I see them look at me with their eyes. And... Um, even this afternoon, I was talking with my mom, and she said, you got to say hello to Rocky. <laughs> hey, Rockport, how you doing? <laughs> I mean, there's a level of sophistication there. And there's a, a brain, and there's organs. You know, I dissected a pig in, in high school. I remember that. But yet, so vastly different from, from a human. Here's what Isaiah says, Isaiah 55. As the heavens are above the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. We, boy, with, with these little noodles, we're not going to figure it all out. But God, in His infinite wisdom, chose to make you in His likeness. Whew. Don't ever again Fall for the lie that the devil throws at us over and over again. You're a loser. You'll never amount to anything. You're a waste of skin. You're a failure. Oh, no, you are not. Amen. You were made in the image of God. Yes. Yes. And God doesn't make junk. That's right. <laughs> so... Um, so here's, here's what we said. Let me go back just for a moment. We said uh, the Imago Dei is modeled from the beginning by the father-son relationship. Now for all of you females, wait for next week. The Imago Dei is modeled from the beginning by the inclusion of everyone, male and female, he made them. Oh, I'm uncomfortable now, Pastor Keith. Well, I'm going to leave you right there. <laughs> I'm going to leave you right there, hanging all week. In fact, maybe you can come back with some answers for me by next Wednesday night. But let's just leave by tonight by the, the absolute assurance that God made us. He loves us and He cares for us. Father, thank You for Your Holy Word. How amazing are you? you? You took so many risks in making us in your likeness. And, but it was worth it to you. It was so worth it to you. And uh, Lord Jesus, I'm glad that you only had to die once, not many times, because the scripture says that the Son of Man died once for our sins and then after that the judgment. So um, it was worth it for you. I suppose we've messed up so many times. I'm glad you only had to die once because we, we have messed up so much that, that if, if it weren't the case that you died one time, it would be nothing but an ongoing, endless, endless cycle of sacrifices. Amen. But praise to your name. You evaluated it. Father, you looked at humanity. Lord Jesus, it says from the foundation of the world, the Lamb was slain. Father, in your infinite wisdom, it was your plan. It was not plan B. It was not you scurrying around heaven trying to figure out some plan because man sinned. You were not, you were not caught off guard. You outwitted the enemy from the very beginning. You tricked him by his own devices and you rescued humanity. And we're made in your likeness. 
I guess that's amazing to us. The times that are troubling to us are when we realize how very much we're not like you. For me, it's so often I, that side of me surfaces that is not like you. And I truly detest that, Lord. I, I want to be more like you. I want to be more like you. I thank you for my brothers and sisters. I pray that we would leave encouraged tonight, strengthened, empowered to be your representatives in the earth. Let us be the carriers of your image everywhere we go. Amen. In the name of Jesus, amen. 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 Blessings, all of you. God bless you. Have a good one.